It's Friday, and Boise State Public Radio's George Prentice is with me to tackle the week's news. We dig into the recent violation of the Idaho Open Meeting Law by the Ada County Library Board, new flight destination options at the Boise Airport, and I fill George in on MILF culture, a sentence I never thought I would say in my life. It's Friday, April 28th. I'm Emma Arnold, and this is what Boise's talking about. Hi, George. Hi, Emma. So good to see you. Welcome back. Thank you. I always love this invite. It's one of the absolute pleasures. I mean, is this work? It it is for you. It's not for me. That's for sure. (laughs) No, it doesn't feel like work for me either. This is uh, something I look forward to all the time. And I've actually really wanted to talk to you about this because it's so weird and complicated. So let's just start with this Idaho Statesman story about how The Ada Community Library appears to have violated Idaho Open Meeting Law when it removed six books from their collection. Uh, What do you think, George? I think this is such a weird and interesting little thing that happened. I do. I've got so many thoughts. I guess the first question I would have for a listener is, can you name me a branch of the Ada Community Library? I only know because it was my home library growing up, the Ada Community Library out on Five Mile and Victory. But I think most people have no idea. There's one in Hidden Springs, one in Star, and I think Mm -hmm. Victory. I think that might be it, actually. I think so, too. Yeah. Tinier, tinier, smaller libraries for sure. But they they removed these books that were like on the the challenged books list sort of quietly. And then Idaho Statesman did a, a great article about it. And then they said, oh, okay, maybe we weren't supposed to do that. Oops. Sorry. Yeah, oops. Yeah, a big oops. So (laughs) it turns out that this truly was a direct reaction to the legislature and the legislature's actions and the bill that passed, but the governor vetoed, right, on libraries. Uh, But the Board of Trustees for Ada Community Library openly admitted that based on the conversation at the legislature, they, quote unquote, reviewed a number of books. It's like, what does that mean? Uh, And what's your policy? And by the way, I've read their policies. There's nothing in there about any of this. Um, And they chose to remove half a dozen books from their shelves. Little thing called uh, open meeting laws uh, requires if you're going to take action, you can pretty much talk about anything. But if you're going to take action, you need to let the people know ahead of time, at least put it on your agenda. And they didn't do that. So, indeed, they these books remain on the shelves, but they're going to meet again in May. Why wouldn't they do it again, put it on the agenda this time and do it again? So, the bigger picture, don't you think, Emma, is what is going on in libraries in every community in this state? And yeah. there are librarians who are probably thinking twice about their profession, the fact that there are they have heard lawmakers think that they put children's lives in danger and they have heard lawmakers actually threaten them with uh, a crime if if there's distribution of certain books so yeah there's this half a dozen books that are probably eventually not going to be on the shelves but what the heck is going on in communities all across Idaho yeah, and the list of books, George. And one of the books that they removed was Toni Morrison. Like you're you're removing Toni Morrison, uh, a book that we read in high school, The Bluest Eye. You know, you're removing those from the library. You know that. I mean, obviously, a lot of these books are written by authors who are black, people of color, indigenous, LGBTQ. You know, these books all sort of revolve around the experience of marginalized communities, but. I would think that this library board, uh, which I I had heard that none of them on the Ada County Community Library Board, none of them are librarians, actually, which is sort of interesting. I just can't imagine being on any kind of library board and taking Toni Morrison off of a shelf, no matter who is telling you to. Toni Morrison is on a hit list. Toni Morrison books are on a national hit list. And when you see the lists of the most banned books in America— They usually include Beloved or other titles from Toni Morrison. Books, yeah, that you and I grew up with. 
are being challenged and in many communities are being yanked from shelves. So Toni Morrison is definitely on what I would consider a hit list in other communities. And that then raises the bigger question. Why did they choose that book? Why did they pick that book? There, there are clearly lists being circulated from entities from outside of Idaho and some from inside Idaho saying, yeah, this book, this book, this book, this book, as opposed to a, a question from a parent or a teacher saying, can you look at this book? No. I mean, let's 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 put this out there. There are hit lists. Yeah. I'm wondering if you have any insight on this. Like, why would they do this? Like the library bounty bill vetoed by the governor, Meridian Library, that whole situation, Meridian Library is safe. And the people in the Treasure Valley, to me, it seems like it's they've made themselves very clear that they support their libraries, that they love these libraries, that they are not about these book bans. So I don't understand why this board would preemptively come in after this you know, I, we'll, we'll call it a victory, but it was a soft victory of the governor vetoing this bill. Like, why come in and pull these books? This argument is far from over. That veto yeah. did not end this conversation. And so, uh, at least from where I sit, where does something like this come from? Fear. This comes mm. from fear. Um, so, Emma, I need to share with you that I actually just had a conversation with someone who uh, helps librarians for a living. Uh, her name is Erin Downey, and I called the Boise School District, and I said, I want to talk to somebody about school libraries in the wake of what's happening at the legislature. And they pointed me to Erin Downey, who was a district consulting librarian. In other words, she is the go-to person for practice and policy for all of the school librarians throughout the Boise School District. And so we just had a conversation. I've not aired this interview yet. I'll probably air it next week. So I'm giving you a, an exclusive preview here. Nice. <laughs> yeah. But it was the conversation that I was hoping for, which is to say she spoke from the heart. Uh, and she, and she uh, when I asked her, what's your sense of, you know, what's going on with librarians? Uh, can I just share a quote with you? Please. Absolutely. Please. She said this, quote, when suddenly it feels like your community doesn't believe in you or doesn't believe in what you do or thinks that you're actively trying to harm children, that's really, really disheartening. It's been an exhausting year for a lot of us. I didn't realize how much until I was trying to lead a meeting just last week and had to stop. I couldn't stop crying in the middle of this meeting. It's been weighing on us all. I think a lot more than any of us really admit. And this is in Boise School District, which I'm assuming most parents, I think it's fair to say, have librarians back. But mm -hmm. a librarian is a librarian, and they're worried. And this is, and, and my guess is, is that's not uncommon, right? That's probably yeah. not uncommon. But here is this woman whose job it is to inspire other librarians. Can you imagine? I mean, picture that, right? And she's in front of a room of school librarians, and she's breaking down crying. And so... Yeah, that's that's what's going on. And by the way, she has been in this job for 14 years. And in 14 years, she said only one book in the entire Boise School District was ever challenged in 14 years. And I said, but what do you think about the culture now? It's like, well, I guess we're going to see. Wow, that's so interesting because, you know, I have uh, two kids in the Boise School District and we recently got an email sent home that said, hey, these are the four books that we're picking for ninth graders to read, you know, as part of this series we're doing. Um, here's an opt-out form for any of all, any or all of them. And um, and I was looking at the books thinking, this is f so funny because these are so much more tame than what I read in high school, in junior high. You know, we... I, I, you know, we read Toni Morrison. We read, we read stuff yeah. that had r some real teeth to it, which, you know, as a teenager, I was so eye rolly. Oh, catcher in the rye, ooh, you know, but now I'm like, oh my gosh, mm -hmm. they've just had to sort of, I don't want to say dumb down because that is not fair. I do think the books that they chose are actually really great. And I think like my son enjoyed them, but still I thought, oh, that's so wild. And then like the day after that, I got an email that said, hey, after the PSATs, we're going to be watching the movie Cars. And because of recent events, you know, the children's Pixar movie Cars, we're, uh, but because of recent events, we're sending home a permission slip for parents to sign for, for these are 14 and 15-year-old kids. I mean, 
I, by the time I was 15, I had been driving for a year. I had had a full time job. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's so strange to me. I'm like, why are we why are we acting like and, and they sent it home several times and said, hey, for reals, if your ki- if you don't sign this, your kid has to go sit in a room with the other kids who are not allowed to watch cars. Uh, and I thought, you know, I was thinking back to when I was in sixth grade, we watched uh, the movie based on, I can't remember the name of the movie, but it's based on the book Hatchet, which I think every kid in the, in the in Alive read the book Hatchet as a child, the survival story. And during the movie, we were watching it, and then the teacher had forgotten to warn parents or warn anybody and just yelled, oh, there's a butt in a minute. There's a naked butt. Try to be mature about it. And there was, he gets naked and he jumps off a cliff into the water. You got to see a butt in sixth grade. We all, we were not mature about it. We all screamed butt and fell out of our chairs laughing. But that's like normal stuff. That's normal stuff. And I can't believe that like, you couldn't show that movie now in a school. You'd have to, you know, oh my gosh, the fight you'd have over someone seeing a butt, you know, like it's part of this whole like, I don't know, cultural thing happening right now that's acting like at the same time that we're trying to act like we're protecting children, all these states are uh, making it so that you can work, um, children can work younger and younger in more and more dangerous jobs. And I'm like, this is, this is, I don't quite, I can't quite wrap my head around how we're trying to infantilize teenagers at the same time we're trying to make them part of the adult workforce. (laughs) So interesting you mentioned that because now I'm thinking about reading Kurt Vonnegut books, for instance, when I was mm-hmm. in like middle school. And and I'm thinking back, it's like, oh my gosh, Slaughterhouse Five, that was really and and so, but Kurt Vonnegut changed my life. Oh, same. Yeah. I, I wanted to be a writer. You know, the, you know, uh JD Salinger changed my life. Uh I, I like to think for the better, uh, to want to explore the human condition and then being able to to express that in the written form. Uh, One of the things I was reminded of in the conversation I had was for all of the conversation that we have had about teachers and thanking teachers and being grateful for teachers and all that, all good, she said, could you please include a librarian on that list? Mm. If you know a librarian, let them know that you appreciate them or give them a hug. And I think that that might be a really good message as, uh, as, you know, touchy feel is that sounds, uh, I think we ought to be praising librarians probably more than ever right now. Yeah, no, that is such a good point. And, you know, I always uh, buy gift cards for my kids' teachers, and I always try to be like, thank you, thank you, thank you. But I do think librarians get left out of that conversation. So let's just do it now. Hey, thank you, librarians. We appreciate you so much. I'm sorry you've been through a year, two years of hell with another year most likely coming up and that there, it's unavoidable, it seems like. Like, you can pull these six books. There's going to be six more, you know? It doesn't... It, Always. The, the people asking you to pull these books, books are not going to be appeased until the libraries are closed and there aren't public spaces for kids to exercise their own freedom, essentially, to to learn what they want to learn and and read what they want to read. I don't think this debate is anywhere near over, and uh, there are factors at the in the legislature that are, quite frankly, counting votes. They're trying to find okay, how do we get a veto-proof bill through? Um, I don't. I think this is going to come back at us in less than a year. Next year, it'll it'll come right back at us. <laughs> Let's move on to the story Boise Dev just did about the airport, uh, saying there the airport is hoping to add some new flight destination options in the next few years. And I know you travel a lot. I travel a lot. That's pretty exciting. Absolutely. I, I love stories about travel. I live vicariously through other people. I love to see people's travel photos. So I'm always <laughs> curious where people have been and what they've done or where they're going. Um, We have an episode coming out, I think it's in a couple of weeks, where we did a deep dive with your NPR pal, Kirk Siegler, uh, where he talked about why he is, like, obsessed with the Boise Airport. He loves it so much. But we did kind of start – we got into a lack of direct flights, uh, which can be a really frustrating thing about flying out of Boise. Uh, Any places you wish we could fly direct from Boise? Anything on your wish list? Well, I think we always want hubs, right? So we know that we have more than a few flights to Salt Lake City. That's a hub. I think we truly could add a flight or two to Seattle, another hub. But we had a red-eye flight to Atlanta 
which of course is a is the busiest airport I think in the world, right? Mm -hmm. um, and they discontinued that red eye flight right after uh, the holidays. And I decided to do a piece where I went out to the airport and talked to the people on a red eye flight and, you know, the crew, et cetera. And what I learned was, and I probably shouldn't have been surprised, is that that was one of the most popular flights in the history of the Boise airport because it was going to a major hub and yet they discontinued it. And what I was told was, well, it was less about how many people flew and it was some other corporate decision. So let's get that going again. Let's get that red eye flight back to Atlanta so that you can fly to Paris and, and Brussels and Amsterdam direct from there. Um, we probably could use more than, I don't even know if we have more than one or two flights to DFW that we need. And here's, here's my real pet peeve. We only have one airline that goes direct to Portland. Yeah. <laughs> and as a result, the price of a flight to Portland is ridiculous. If Southwest returned their direct service to Portland, um, the, the flights on Alaska, the prices would go down. The competition would drive the price back down again. That's crazy. That's absolutely crazy that it costs more to fly to Portland than it does sometimes to Chicago or Minneapolis, St. Paul. Yeah, when they used to have that flight, I used to fly to Portland all the time, and it would be like $79. Right. And it's so expensive now. I haven't flown to Portland in forever. It's because one airline's doing it. Yep. Blake at our Hey Boise newsletter asked people, like, what is your wish list? What? And our audience got back to us, and people said J a lot of East Coast stuff, like you said, JFK, mm -hmm. Newark, Nashville, New Orleans, Dallas, uh, Boston came up quite a few times, Hartford, Connecticut, St. Louis. Uh, but there were some smaller cities in there, too, which I completely agree with. Bend came up a couple times. Reno came up. Um, that Reno flight was a real was really nice for me because I could pop down there, do a show, come home the next day. Um, you know, it's a it's not a, the worst drive in the world, but it's kind of a long one. And Laura pointed out that we desperately need some nonstop flights to Southern California, which I if you're listening and you're in charge of that, if you work for Southwest or something, ugh, a direct flight to Burbank would just make my life so much easier. And we used to have one. We used to we, have one. I used to take right. it all the time. And right now, even, yeah, if you want to go to San Diego uh, or L.A., you have to route through Oakland, um, or, or Las Vegas, which is ridiculous. We should have a couple flights to Southern California. So so, so the Boise Airport has, uh, first of all, they rebounded quicker than most communities uh, uh, post-pandemic as far as passenger traffic. So the Boise Airport is doing just fine. As a matter of fact, not only are they uh, about to open up new parking facilities, if you've noticed, there's a lot of construction out there. The next big thing is, I don't know if you know this, Emma, but they're going to they're going to build an entire new uh, concourse. Yeah. So when you come through security, as you know, you can only go left or go downstairs. This concourse would go to the right and build all the way out there. So we know that there are more flights. We know more people are flying here. More people have moved here. More businesses are here. It only makes sense. But there's this really bizarre dance that airports have to have with airlines where airlines say, well, can you promise X number of people will fill these seats? And it's like, well, I can't promise. And when you can't promise, they ask you to, quote unquote, subsidize them to pay for the seats, even if people aren't sitting in them. And I know, for instance, that uh, Ketchum pays airlines. They subsidize some airlines just to have flights fly in there in spite of the fact that some of those flights are kind of half half full. Um, but the Boise Airport shouldn't have to subsidize. And I think that any airline paying attention can see, yeah, this is not only a travel culture, but it, we're isolated, right? Yeah. We're the biggest community of, of, our, of our size in this part of the Western U.S. that is so far away from the next biggest community. Yeah, I started driving everywhere after they cut so many of those flights. I started having to sort of drive to so many places. And it, you know, you're, we're six hours from anything, from right. everything. Yep. And it's such a pain. So, um, well, fingers crossed on that Burbank flight. Please, somebody get that going for me. It'd be really amazing. But we've come toward, to our favorite part, you and I, of our uh, conversations that we get to have. George, what have you been watching? I am really, really excited for 
people to see a new miniseries, which is going to launch Monday, uh, May 1st. Uh, and it is called A Small Light. Oh. And it's not, uh, and get this, it's going to stream not on one, but three services all at once. It's going to be available on Disney, on Nat Geo, and Hulu. And I saw the first two episodes in Sun Valley, and I had modest expectations. This blew me away. It blew oh. me away. It is the story of Anne Frank and her family being hidden uh, during Nazi occupation in Amsterdam. And it's a story I think that most of us know. But it is through the eyes of a young Meep Geese who was in her early 20s. And she was the secretary of Otto Frank. Uh, when Otto Frank came to her and said, can you hide us? You need to think about this. She said, no, I don't. I don't have to think about this. And it was this 20-something young woman and her husband and it's romantic because they show her falling in love with her husband, et cetera. But, but it's, it's epic as well. It blew me away. And Boiseans have an advantage here because they may remember in the 1990s, an 87-year-old Meep geese traveled to Boise, Idaho to plant a tree at what would become the only Anne Frank Memorial in the United States. Of course, that's the Anne Frank Memorial in Boise. Anyway... This miniseries is gorgeous, uh, shot on location in Amsterdam and Prague. Uh, Liev Schreiber plays Otto Frank. Belle Pauli, a uh, wonderful actress, plays Meep Geese. This is a star-making uh, performance. And, and all I could think of is, wow, this is through a young adult. I think, I think young audiences will absolutely plug into this. It's got a killer soundtrack. And it tells a story that we think we know, but through a different lens. And it's done so well, it blew me away. It caught me totally off balance. And it's one of those, it's one of those series that I think that people in their teens and people in their 80s are going to love it and everyone in between. Wow, I can't wait to see it. That sounds beautiful. That sounds wonderful. It's really good. Yep. I don't want you to ask me now what I've been watching. No, I have to ask. What, what have you been watching? I mean, I love... I love guilty pleasures. <laughs> you are not going to love this one, I think. Okay. So uh, for a podcast, I was asked to watch all of the show uh, Milf Manor. Uh, are you familiar <laughs> with Milf Manor, George Prentice? <laughs> I'm familiar with the title. I have never seen it, <laughs> although now you've given me a reason. It's like if you're if you're recommending it, I guess uh, that gives me license. No, I am not recommending it. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, it's not okay. even a guilty pleasure. I like crappy reality TV occasionally. I like sure. uh, Alone. I like The Amazing Race. Um, but this was, I'm I'm grateful in some ways that I watched it because I feel like it's a real gut check for the state of modern feminism, and uh, I feel like. So it, what? What? Where is the? It, where is it streaming? Um, we watched it on Amazon Prime, okay. and uh, it is uh, it is deeply, deeply bizarre. Like truly, so the I guess you're not familiar with the premise, which is that some milfs, which I yeah. can't believe I'm saying to you, George. I can't yeah. believe I'm using that words to, to <laughs> say. To say so to this you. is reality, right? <laughs> this is reality is... television. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And um, so these milfs go to an island, thinking they're gonna like, or not an island, to a, a big manor uh, in Mexico, and they think that they're like going to milf it up. And then it turns out the twist is that the men who are there at the manor, it's sort of a bachelor, you know, bachelorette type thing. The men that are there are their sons. It's all of their sons are there. What? Yes, This George. is so wrong. <laughs> oh, my God. Bizarre. And um, it's really, you know, from, a, from an anthropology standpoint, I tried to watch it with an open mind. And I tried to watch it, you know, just sort of the with like, I, I kind of, in the first couple episodes, kept pausing it and just sort of being like, wow, I can't believe I live in a time where this is a television show. Like, this feels like a joke that someone made in the, you know, 90s about how bad the future could be, and then we're here. So are um, some of the contestants hooking up with other contestants' yes, yes, children? Yes, yes, yeah. And some of them, okay. Oh, my it, God. I could, I mean, I if people want to hear my, my true, like, very long thoughts, they can listen to... Uh, we didn't get a rose is the podcast I was on to talk about it because I had some very strong opinions on it, obviously. Uh, but uh, yeah, that's the premise of it. And I don't I'm not recommending it to you other than wouldn't it be funny if you watched Milf Manor, George, and then we talked about it because that would be 
the funniest thing in the world. I, um, can I pass on that one though? <laughs> you can. I you just can. Just say, can, oh, oh, can I? Can I drop one more on you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Please. So, have you ever heard of the book? And it's a bestseller in uh, in uh, Europe. The book, The Gentle Art of Swedish Death cleaning? Yes. Yes, I have. And actually, so my family, uh, my mother's side of the family is Swedish, like, yeah. deep, you know, Swedish American. Yeah. And uh, they practice that, actually. So I I was not aware of this. I ordered the book from Amazon. I poured through it. it as you know, it's a Swedish phenomenon of uh, getting your affairs in order before mm-hmm. time goes by. It's less about preparing for death. It's more about just, just going through your life with less emotional and physical clutter. Amy Poehler got the rights to this book and has created a series where Swedish uh, intervention team of, you know, therapists, et cetera, come into eight people's lives and give them a Swedish death cleaning and wow. uh, the, in America. And this starts, I think, next week on Peacock. And I saw the first episode. I adored this. It's all positive. It's lovely. Amy Poehler narrates it. And I had no idea what Swedish death cleaning was, but it makes absolute sense. And boy, am I a candidate for that. <laughs> Are you? Oh, my God. I could God. come over and do it for you. Absolutely. I'm, a, I'm a, the queen of decluttering. I love to, anytime I'm feeling super stressed, that's exactly what I do. I will definitely be checking that show out because that is that is so my jam. Uh, I love being, every time I'm overwhelmed, I'm like, well, it must be time to organize something, and then I'll feel better. So, yeah, let me come Swedish declutter you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I much prefer over uh, MILF, MILF Manor. <laughs> much preferred, yes. Okay. Well, sounds good. Well, George, we should probably uh, get out of here. I could talk to you all day about books, MILFs, and airports, uh, but we probably we probably should go back to our, day j- our other jobs. <laughs> but thank you so much. It's always such a pleasure to have you, and we really appreciate you coming on. Check, check, and check. Thanks, Emma. That's all for today here on CityCast Boise. The show is produced by Frankie Barnhill, Evelyn Avitia, and me, Emma Arnold. Blake Hunter writes our Hey Boise newsletter, and our music is by Up Is The Down Is The. If you enjoyed our show today, leave us a review. It helps other people find us. We'll be back Monday with more stories from around the city. Bye. Bye.